much too complex. Too complex. Much too complex. Welcome back to the Black Track, where I do commentary and review on movies with an all black cast or at least a black lead. Today's movie is Poetic Justice, John Singleton's 1993 follow up to his first movie, Boys in the Hood. While not as iconic as that movie, I like the fact that Poetic Justice sets out to tell a story from a different perspective. That perspective being the female side of life in the urban areas of California. In most of these hood films from the 90s, you never really hear about how the gang violence and other happenings affect the women. So Singleton wanted to show the complexities of life after a traumatic experience and how it affected mental states going forward. He took a chance on first time actress Janet Jackson for the lead in his film, but in my opinion, she killed it. Somehow Janet is a natural playing the street smart but ambitious character Justice. So much so that you would think that she wasn't actually acting at all, but she definitely is. Singleton also took a chance on his good friend Tupac Shakur for the supporting role as Lucky, but not as much so since Tupac had already showed he was also a natural in the movie Juice, which came out the previous year. Not to mention that it gets lost to history that Tupac was a theater student and did a lot of acting in high school, so he was no amateur. As far as the rest of the cast goes, with the exception of comedian Joe Torre, Singleton played it a little safe and many of the other actors in the movie appeared in Boys in the Hood, like Tyra Pharrell, Regina King, and a few others. As a matter of fact, nearly everybody in the movie has appeared in at least one of the Black Trap movies I've done, so it's kind of a Black Trap reunion. Poetic Justice has the distinction of being one of the only movies to continue filming during the LA riots, so that gives it quite the backdrop, despite it being mostly a road trip movie and taking place outside of the city majority of the time. Assembling a great cast and picking a great location is very important, but does all that translate into a great movie? Let's black track and find out. Oh, you thought Poetic Justice was a black movie? Joke's on you. We start out with our main characters Billy Zane and Lori Petty sharing a glass of wine together to set the mood. I last spoke about Billy Zane with his great performance in the movie Posse, but here he's showing off his romantic side. Of course, I'm just kidding though. This is a random fake movie that John Singleton decided to include in Poetic Justice for this drive-in scene. Our real main character, Justice, is just trying to enjoy the greatness of Billy Zane, but Q-Tip here is too busy trying to take a bite out of her Bonita apple bum. Jeez, look at the size of those earrings. She agrees to give him some action if he'll prove his love by going to get her some popcorn and juju bees. On the way, he's spotted by some dudes who feel like they know him from somewhere. Looks like Q-Tip knows it too. One of those dudes is Lloyd Avery Jr. A man who is infamous among the black community, simply because he shot Ricky in Boys in the Hood. Some roles you just can't shake, I guess. After playing that character in Boys in the Hood, Lord Avery went on to have quite the downward spiral, which is too much to get into here. But unfortunately, it ended in his death in prison in 2005. Common sense would have told Q-Tip to go ahead and raise up out of there with the quickness. I mean, he clearly had the clearance, but he was too blinded and distracted by Miss Jackson and her nasty to see the gun pointed at his head that ends his life. Everybody takes off, leaving Justice to fend for herself when they hear the shot, but man, they aren't really in a hurry. The people in Boys in the Hood took off faster than this when they heard a gun. Maybe John Singleton didn't want to surprise the crowd this time since last time somebody almost got ran over. I'm guessing it's a year later. The movie doesn't really tell us. It could be next week for all I know. Justice is kind of a recluse, sitting at home all alone, writing poetry, hence the name Poetic Justice. As a side note, Maya Angelou wrote all of the poetry that's in this movie. A favorite that John Singleton said that she probably regretted when she realized all the profanity that was in this movie. And he's not lying either. I know I said House Party 2 held the black track record for the most amount of profanity in the movie, but I think this one may have it beat. I love how John Singleton reuses camera work. This is almost the exact same camera placement from when Trey was walking down the sidewalk in Boys in the Hood. Justice does leave the house, at least to go to work, because them braids ain't gonna pay for themselves. This hair salon she works at is ran by a woman named Jessie, who's played by Tyra Pharrell who I actually last showed in my black track for the movie School Days, even though I didn't mention her. She was one of the Gamma Rays, and I meant to mention the fact that the Gamma Rays were supposed to be all light skin, and clearly she isn't. Dang, Ricky Mama said I done lost both my boys, I'm about to get my groove back. On the way into the shop, she's accosted by this bum played by Michael Collier, who was showboating House Party 3. I guess this was before the Chitlin circuit took off. Then one more cameo for the road, since Baja Jackson, who played young Doughboy in Boys in the Hood, also works at the shop. Jesse tells Justice it's about time she get back out there and find her a man, and what good timing since the mailman Lucky, played by Tupac, shows up for his daily route and sees something he likes in Justice, despite her always looking so mean. What's your name? Lucky. Lucky? Yeah. I know you're not being funny about names, Justice. The way Janet Jackson is chewing that gum in this scene is so classic, 
And it seems like she's gonna give Lucky some play. Man, I guess you are Lucky. Let's cut the bullshit, okay? You wanna smell my punani? Hmm? Yeah. This fine young dark brother said he wanna smell my punani. Mm. Mm hmm. <sighs> so, what do you think? You need to get your ass some breath nets. Or not. They pulled that off way too smoothly. I wonder how many other brothers they done pulled that off on before. If you couldn't tell by now, Lucky works at the post office, along with Chicago here played by Joe Torre. There's another callback to Boys in the Hood in this scene with George Bush face being full of holes like Rangus was in Boys in the Hood. This time with darts. Man, Singleton really hates Reagan and Bush. I think this scene only exists because somebody, either Jackson or Singleton, thought it would be necessary to include Janet Jackson's boyfriend at the time, Rene Alizondo Jr., who's this guy here. He brings nothing to the movie. John Singleton said he wanted to expose real hood and ghetto stories that you don't normally see on the big screen in this movie. And nothing says ghetto more than Lucky and Tone Lokier sharing the same baby mama. But not only getting along, but crashing at her place like it's the neighborhood hangout spot. Tone Lok gets much less dialogue in this movie than he did in the movie Posse, but he's always decent anyway. I wish they didn't do so much cussing in front of these kids. And what you cleaning up for? This place look fucked up as normal. But like John Singleton said, this is real life. Lucky gets into an argument with this baby mom's, not only over her continued crack use, but also because she was in the back with a whole negro this entire time. I know Ricky Harris here was nervous as hell in that room. Damn, I lied. Now you was back there quiet this entire time, and now you want to bring attention to yourself? Now look at you, getting tenderized. Sadly, comedian Ricky Harris died in 2016. He was a hilarious dude, he will be missed. Man, you could tell Justice lives in Big Mama's house. Look at the decor. John Singleton cut out the stuff about Justice moms and grandmas being dead. So it's actually kind of crazy that old black people have such a distinctive style that you immediately know it's an old person's house. Oh, is that how that works? I always wondered how the girls got those tips like that when I was in high school. Lucky's moms is veteran black mom Jennifer Lewis. Damn, she was working overtime in 1993. She played a mother in this, the meteor man, and what's love got to do with it? Lucky wants to keep his daughter at his mom's house since her mom is a crackhead, and her response is a classic black mother response. Now, are you gonna take care of her? Yeah. Well, you just remember that show, baby. I'm done raising kids. Justice and her friend Aisha, played by Regina King, oh, I'm sorry, that's Academy Award winner Regina King, are supposed to be going to a hair show, but Justice's car breaks down, so they have to find another way there. It just so happens that Aisha is dating Lucky's co-worker Chicago, and he and Lucky need to go on a work-related trip to the same city as the hair show. That's bad news for Justice because now you gotta sit next to the Negro you curved as a joke. Hey, at least Lucky has a real job with benefits. That's a high chance that Justice's last boyfriend was a street pharmacist. They get off to a bad start with Justice not even wanting to have a conversation with Lucky. That is, until Lucky drops the magic word. Oh, so you one of them angry bitches, huh? A feminist. What you call me? Said you a mean bitch. That word still to this day will set a woman off, but especially in the 90s. And Justice would rather walk all the way to Oakland than to deal with one of these death row Negroes. The funniest part of this is the little stumble that Janet Jackson does while walking because she's so mad. Singleton said that she did it on accident at first, and he had her recreate it a second time and it was perfect. Poetic Justice is basically a movie about discovery. Each character has some kind of past trauma or negative influence in their life that causes them to act a certain way and this trip is all about them figuring themselves out. Chicago is vain and insecure, so he constantly brushes his hair and brags about the fact that he works out. We already know Justice has issues stemming from her boyfriend's death. Lucky doesn't have any purpose in life, and this trip is partially about going to help his cousin with his rap career. And Aisha, well, I guess she finally took Doughboy's advice. You better take your ass to the store with that. Because she drinks too much and ends up causing a scene everywhere she goes. Which is kind of funny because Ice Cube was originally supposed to play Lucky until he turned it down because he didn't want a romantic movie to damage his image. So gangster. It's a well known fact that if somebody makes fun of you, then there's a chance that they actually like you. So Lucky might actually be in there because the first thing out of Justice's mouth when they finally did decide to make conversation is. Your nails are so dirty. Yeah, well, these nuts clean though. These four are the worst kind of people to travel with because they're the type of people who have to stop everywhere when you're just trying to get there on time. They smell something good and conveniently come across a sign that says they're close to a family reunion. Who has a family reunion that far off the path that you need a sign on the highway to guide people to it? Clearly I don't know what the f I'm talking about because this family reunion is packed. 
I'm starting to think that the main characters aren't the only people here pretending to be family. Ain't no way this many black folk coordinating something this big. Nobody questions who they are, and this drunk uncle even pretends to remember Lucky from when he was a kid. Maya Angelou is even here as a judgmental old lady pretending she wasn't just as loose as Aisha when she was younger. Things are going good until Aisha gets so drunk that she starts chopping it up with another man. Chicago doesn't even notice because he and Lucky are at the spades table. Man, y'all a little too comfortable with these strangers for me. This leads to Chicago trying to fight the dude, because like I said, he's insecure. And to avoid possibly being discovered as frauds, they just up and leave. Not before Tupac asked for a to-go plate though, just like a negro. I ain't even mad though, I bet the macaroni's slamming. We get a little more exposition when Justice checks her homegirl and tearfully tells Aisha that her drunk behavior reminds her of her mother. And that's about all we get in regards to that story. Like I said earlier, John Singleton actually filmed the scenes with Justice talking about her mother and grandmother, but decided to cut it from the movie because it was just taking up too much time and wasn't relevant to the story. Nah, don't come hugging up on me now. You embarrassed the fuck out of me, girl. The tables are starting to turn on Lucky and Chicago's relationship, as Chicago's insecurity starts rubbing him the wrong way when Chicago decides to diss his cousin's music. Lucky will tolerate no slander towards his family. What would you do? I can dress. I can see if he said he designed his own clothes, but this nigga said he's good at wearing other people's clothes, as opposed to somebody who comes up with their own rap lyrics. Coming up with compelling lyrics and dialogue is hard. Trust me on this one. The next scene is my favorite. It's super out of place, but it still works and brings some much needed comedy to the movie. Each character has an internal dialogue about what they're thinking and it perfectly expresses how they really feel about each other. It's crazy because these are all the things that they can easily just tell each other and get it over with, but they choose to internalize it for no reason. Hmm, I wonder. Nah, you probably got babies and shit. Damn, she kinda cute. Got a nice little frame. Maybe I should get that number. See how the booty work. Oh, I know what I gotta do when I get back. I gotta call Terry with his fine ass. I'm a good looking nigga. Got a job, income coming in, car, apartment. <laughs> if Chicago and Aisha were more honest with each other, maybe they wouldn't feel the need to have this pity sex. Look at her face. If you feel that way about it, you could have just had a V8 instead. It's made worse by the fact that it lasts like three minutes, if that. Aisha got that fire, huh? You couldn't hold it in, huh? Cause she was riding your little friend, huh? They have a massive argument that leads to yet another stop. But this one is far more serious while Aisha throwing every insult in the book at Chicago. Yeah, that's right. Brush that weak ass fade. Niggas dick can't stay hard five minutes. He stands there and takes it all until he's triggered by the one thing that crosses his line. That's the reason why I'm fucking somebody else. He thinks long and hard on that one before he decides to just go ahead and punch Aisha. And you know ain't no hood girl gonna take that. I'm tripping on that being the one thing to send him overboard. After all the stuff she said, the one thing that you probably already knew is what triggered you? Personally, I would've broken up with her once she insulted my fade. If I spend that much time brushing my hair, I'll be damned if you open your mouth to say something about it. You must be out of your mind. At first, Lucky does nothing. That is, until Justice gets roughed up trying to defend her friend. Now he has no choice, and knocks Chicago out and leaves him stranded 15 miles from their destination for daring to besmirch the good name of Lady Justice. Don't you hate when you're just minding your own business and somebody gives you a reason to get involved? Damn, I wonder how Aisha felt about that. Lucky didn't give a damn about her catching the fade. A strong one too, not that weak one she was talking about. I like how the relationships in this movie go in reverse. Chicago and Aisha start out kind of lovey-dovey, and then descend into hatred. And Lucky and Justice start out not being able to stand each other, and end up growing closer over the course of the trip. Their relationship isn't completely realistic, but I got no problem with how they got there. They stop again, this time for literally no other reason but to have some ambiguous sex before they get to Oakland. I have to pause right here to bring something up, because I know I'm not the only one who heard growing up that this was supposed to be a full on nude sex scene, but that Janet Jackson turned it down because Tupac refused to get an HIV test. I believed that for years until I got old enough to realize I was stupid for believing that in the first place because actors don't actually have sex on set. So that makes no sense. I only bring it up because I expected John Singleton to confirm it on the DVD, but not only does he not mention it, but he also confirms that the scene was always supposed to be how we see it in the movie. The only difference being that it was originally supposed to take place on the beach closer to the water, but they had to change locations because of the rain. Crazy how movie rumors last for so long. Lucky done got the skin, so of course this is the perfect time to tell Justice that he has a daughter. It went over about as well as him telling her she should probably get tested. But Justice isn't really too mad about it, honestly. Before they can even have a conversation about it, Lucky realizes he arrived just in time to see his cousin dead from a gunshot. 
this came out of nowhere. Kind of hard for us to care since we never even saw dude and he only was mentioned about two times. It's enough for Lucky to care and he blames everything on justice. Man, you tripping. If you hadn't stopped to put that poor girl out in the middle of nowhere, stop to steal people's food and stop to get some of that fuzzy temptress, you would have been there on time. With daylight to spare. For a man named Lucky, you sure had some terrible luck. I know that was a lonely ride back home. Good lord, Demeter Joe. You could tell you got some new penis in your life. It changed your whole style up. A whole other movie could have been made just based off the stuff that happens in Jesse's salon. There was almost a fight about a comb earlier. There's always gossip and Candy Alexander, who I talked about on House Party 3, talks trash about a girl right to her face. You could tell people who know how to fight because the audacity. Lucky had time on that long lonely trip to think about the error of his ways and brings his daughter in to get her hair done by justice. He apologizes because dog, look at her. Ooh, I'ma tell my mama. But hold up, did they really leave Chicago 15 miles from Oakland? Did nobody even go back to get dude? There's no way he doesn't go back home and get lucky fired for this. Let's get to the grade. When director John Singleton himself admits that he only made poetic justice to keep his name relevant after his first movie, you know that it's not really a passion project. That being said, it's still a surprisingly enjoyable movie, even if it stumbles on its execution. It does what it set out to do, and that's tell a hood drama story from the perspective of females, but there's just something about it that feels hollow. Sure, it has its fair share of memorable moments, and I can see it definitely being relatable for a particular audience, but I don't think it really nails any of its characters fully, or really goes all in on its poetry theme. Road trip movies, and really movies in general, are all about discovery and becoming a different person than you were in the beginning. Everybody in Poetic Justice, with the exception of Justice, are the same people that they were in the end as they were in the beginning. There's very little growth, and I don't know if John Singleton just didn't have time, or if the dialogue was focused on the wrong things like the constant profanity. We don't find out why Chicago is so insecure, we don't find out what's going on in Aisha's life that causes her to drink so much, and Lucky doesn't really even learn anything about himself. He only convinces Justice that he's the same guy she refused to get to know in the first place. If any movie needed a sequel, it's this one. Not because it's particularly great, but mostly because it leaves so many unanswered threads. Even saying all that, Poetic Justice is still a very watchable movie that benefited from its time period and shows that director John Singleton was the real deal and a master of telling the type of little known stories that otherwise wouldn't be told. My grade for Poetic Justice is a C. Its naturally talented cast help uplift an otherwise average tale with a weak resolution. And that does it for this episode of The Black Track. Let me know what you thought about the movie Poetic Justice in the comments below. And don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on notifications to help me grow my channel. And until next time, I'll holla at you.